I trust and hope that uh, these particular teachings, exposition series in 2 Timothy have continued to be uh, key uh, for you as you transition in ministry, as you transition in life, but as you continue laboring in God's vineyard, wherever the Lord has placed you. This for me is not just an exercise of teaching you, it's also an exercise for me to be reminded of these timely truths uh, of God's word. And indeed, that's the, the great blessing that we do have as believers, that we do have his word, uh, his breath, uh, that is able to refresh and to teach us more. And today we get to chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. Uh, we are nearing the end, uh, but I think it's, it's here in and, and the last couple of weeks that we have been at the heart of the letter of 2 Timothy. So let me pray and then we will dive into looking at the first nine verses of this chapter. Lord, once again, may it please you to open our hearts to hear from you. Pray for these dear ones and myself um, in the ups and the downs of ministry life, in the, in the times of great excitement and times of great doubt, in times of uh, great flourishing, but also in times of dwindling a kind of life. In times when fear uh, comes and, and grips us. And in times when we are too courageous, Lord, may these words of Paul to Timothy, and indeed may these words of yours be an encouragement to us as we continue digging in this particular book of 2 Timothy. So help us, Lord, even today, as we hear about the context of all ministry, about how difficult it can get. Lord, may you help us to know that we are not alone. Our experiences are not new. And yet we can have the confidence that you are with us up to the very end. So Jesus, may you help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read uh, to Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 9, and then we will briefly look at it. Paul writes, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, lecherous, solemn, with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janes and Jamblas opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be praying to all, as was that of those two men. What a tone that we get here as we get to chapter 3. Two key imperatives that I want you to note in this particular passage that I think are very key uh, for us to understanding what is happening in this particular passage. One of it is know or understand. It's what we get in uh, very early on in, in chapter 3 verse 1. But I understand this um, as an imperative. And, and the other one, we find it in verses 5. After, uh, after telling him about the character of these particular people, he tells him, avoid such people. So two key things here, know and avoid. Uh, now I say key because this is what Paul is calling uh, Timothy to sort of almost respond to whatever information that he has given him. But we will come there 
are to look in at it. I don't know whether you have ever visited somebody who is terminally ill in the hospital. And you look at them and humanly speaking, there is no hope for them. They, they seem they are on the sort of dying days. Humanly speaking, one of the biggest temptations is to give false hope. Is to tell them how um, they will get healed. Um, how in the next couple of days they might actually walk out of the hospital. Even when you are thinking, wait a minute, this is a big thing. This is worse. And as humans, most of the times we find ourselves wanting to say nice things, even when the reality might not be the case. But praise the Lord for His word. And even for Paul's words here, because God's word does not hide, does not try to, 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 to paint a different beautiful picture than what it is. It gives us things as they are. Paul continues to talk to his mentee, and one that he hopes will take over ministry once Paul is gone. And Paul has been encouraging him to hold on to the truth when so many people are departing from it. When Paul himself is in jail, he is in dungeon, in fact, because of his ministry, Paul has been encouraging Timothy, this is not the time to look back. It is a time to hold the truth. It is a time to proclaim the truth. It is a time for you to live out the truth. And as we get to chapter 3, you remember last week we were talking about the ministry in the great house. And Paul was telling Timothy how he needs to, to be a vessel of honor, to set himself apart, that was what we discussed last week, um, to, be, to be one who stands out from the crowd of people, to be one who knows that he is, has a master who has sent him, and that is God himself, and, and being aware of that then to present himself as one who is qualified, as one who, who does not need to be ashamed because he can rightly or he can cut rightly the word of God. Well, you might be thinking, Paul might be saying now in chapter 3, but as you do that, many people will come to you, they will fill your church, they will rejoice over you, they will love you, Timothy, and they will walk with you. Well, that's not the case. In fact, you might be thinking, Paul would say, look, it has not been very good in my time, that's why I'm in jail, but Timothy, you will have a nice time. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. There, there are better days ahead. You'll be thinking that's the case. Well, Paul doesn't say that. He says it's going to get worse. It's going to, to be totally bad in the last days. Now, I just need to offer that quick definition. That when we talk about in the scriptures of the last days, it is that time between Christ's first advent or first coming and his second coming. So we are now living in the last days. So since the days when Jesus Christ came and, and, and went back, um, now that we are waiting for his second coming, we are now living in the last days. And Paul says, in the last days, things are going to be tough. You can almost summarize this one that in the last days you're going to have difficult times because you're going to have difficult people. And this is in the context of all ministry. How will the ministry look like even for you and me in the 21st century or even in the 22nd century? And the answer that Paul doesn't want you to miss, the answer that we shouldn't miss today is that it is going to be a difficult time. People are going to be difficult. And why? It is because men are just going to get worse and worse. And, and, and here you may also think of it in terms of the false teaching. And we will be looking at it too, in terms of the character. So I think you're going to look at it in terms of two big things. So why is it going to be difficult? Paul says in verses 1, the last days will be difficult times. Why is it going to be difficult? Well, verse 2, because of difficult people. For people who be lovers of self, lovers of money, blah, blah, all those kind of stuff. And here Paul gives a huge list. And I think... 
the way to summarize it is in two ways. Um, is is one their character. So Paul looks at their character, so the character of people and their ministry. And I think mostly here Paul, even talking about generally people in the church, in the world, but also talking about teachers of God's word. And so we, we started looking at the ministry of the great house. And last week we said there are those who are dishonorable vessels. You can almost think this is a ministry of dishonorable vessels, of false teachers, of those who are not living out the gospel. And so the one thing that he says is their character. Their character, he says, one, they are going to be lovers of self. What a, what a term to hear for us um, in the 21st century. You'd almost think, you know, Paul was seen the right exact picture of 21st century. You hear the description here, thinking, yeah, this sounds like us today. Lovers of souls. These people who are doing ministry, not for God, but for themselves. Not for other people, but for themselves. They are not using it to serve people. Um, I, and and I, I can't go on and on, but you know, when we talk about the selfishness, sort of, um, the, uh, the, the obsession with self, or what some people have called narcissism, it is where you're so much obsessed with yourself that everything you do rotates and it's all about you. And it's kind of very interesting because in the last couple of years, this has then become worse, even generally speaking, where people even will say they, they have fallen in love with themselves. Um, you know, people will post an, a nice photo of themselves and say, um, a glory to God. And, and they will say how they are thanking God. Uh, but actually, it's all about them, them, themselves. It's me, myself, and I kind of a theme. And Paul was telling Timothy, look, for these false teachers, for these kind of people, this is what is going to be happening. They are going to be about them. One of my teachers used to say, they, they want a designer ministry. It's, it's theirs. It's designed for them. Everything is working out well. But apart from that, these people will also be lovers of money. What a shame. They do not do gospel ministry for the benefit of saving and snatching others from, uh, from the fire of hell. They do it to be able to gain money. They need money. Uh, a year ago we had one of the preachers here in Kenya confess uh, in the national telly saying that you know, that's all he was doing. It was all about money and it was his business. And what a sad thing to hear that that's Paul was saying that in that particular first century, that there will be men and women whose aim for ministry is nothing but their own money. It's their own belly, is what they want. In fact, look at the next thing is they are lovers of pressure. They want to have stuff for themselves. They are arrogant, they are proud, they are abusive, they are disobedient. All they want is, is pressure. They want to, to enjoy it. They are lovers of pressure and lovers of God. They, you know, what breaks them, what causes them to lack sleep, what really excites them, is not really love for God. It's, it's love for to enjoy this life. That's what they want. In other words, happiness is is the guiding principle. It is the thing that moves them. It is what really wakes them up. And don't we see all this today? men and women, so much psyched up for pressure, whether that be in the church or outside there in ministry. It is all about me. I want the latest bike, the latest car. I want the, the best coach, the best house. I want, I want everything good. I want good holiday in Dubai and all that. And, and sometimes, you know, you might be thinking, yeah, I know those kind of high-end preachers, but are we not like that? Those who love pressure more than God. Those who would, who when we, we are thinking about ministry, we start by asking, what am I benefiting from? What, 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 what is it for me that I'm going to get? And, and I think to almost nail it, you know, you're looking at all that, they are unpeaceable, they are heartless, they are slanderous, they are without self-control, brutal. 
almost thinking, it almost sounds like a list of unbelievers. But wait a minute, look at verse 5. They are having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. There's some kind of piety without power here. There are people who are religious, if you want to put it that way. But actually they are not believers. They are pretentious. You know, they have sort of a form, an outward sort of semblance of godliness. They seem as if they are believers. They seem as if they love the Lord. But what are they doing? They are denying the power. In other words, they are denying that sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. They are denying that regeneration of their hearts. They, they have every posture of a believer. They, they probably pray. They probably uh, give. They probably uh, preach a lot. They probably shout a lot. But when you follow them and their lives, there is no change. They are broken. They are sinful men. They are, they are not living out the gospel. In, in other words, you might think of this as that old saying that they are, they are preachers of water and drinkers of wine. They are people who, who say one thing. They say they, they fear the Lord. But they are committing adultery in their night. They they cry in the pulpit by they squander money in the privacy. They subvert justice of the people. Paul is saying these people have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. What a what a, a tragedy it is to have men and women full in our churches. And even sadly, even pretend to proclaim the good news. But they are not changed men, they are not changed women. They are just but men using the gospel for their own. In fact, it's not just their, their character that is so much fraud, that is not in line with the gospel. It's also their ministry. Look at verse 6. Among these people, Paul continues, they creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. And Paul is saying here, what are they doing? Their ministry is actually praying or, or, or going to take advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. And I think here in this particular time, Paul is talking about women. They, they could have been those who are going to... Uh, uh, those women and committing adultery and all kind of stuff. Uh, those ones who, who probably don't even understand. Um, uh, we have suddenly had these stories of, of even uh, men who would call themselves uh, preachers and, and gospel workers who, who, who look for these particular pe weak people, even in churches. Uh, people who don't understand the gospel and they might tell them like they need to sleep with them or something for, for them to to get children out there for them to be accepted by the Lord. They, they look for those prayer, weak ones. Or even those people, those who don't have uh, the right standing of the gospel, they pray on them. What kind of a ministry can you imagine? In other words, they, they take the advantage they do have as, as men, as those who proclaim the gospel, to go in and satisfy their lustfulness. So that their method then is, is that one of looking for who is weak to take advantage of, to take their property or to do their stuff. It's whatever makes them happy. And Paul says, these kind of people, they are always learning. They are probably moving from one seminar to another. But they never, they never get it. They don't really get it. That is the kind of people that he is talking about. And he gives an example there because he says, verse 8, they are not the first people. There is Janes and, and Jamblas here who opposed Moses. These are believed to be the magicians 
uh, who were imposters. If you remember how they were doing it, it was kind of interesting because Moses would would do a miracle of coming up with the serpent, and they would also be able to do theirs as well. They were sort of copy, copy and paste. But the truth was, is that their own serpents, their own snakes, would be swallowed by Moses' own snake. And I think, uh, you know, it's quite interesting. Of course, when you go to the book of Exodus, you don't find their names. But I think other historical books would actually say that. But we find those stories in the book of Exodus, chapter 7. Um, you might be able to read about these particular magicians. Which is very interesting that Paul is saying that these guys who will be opposing the truth, who are opposing the truth, these false teachers whose character is fraud, whose ministry is fraud, are like these magicians. They are opposing the truth. They are opposing like they were opposing the truth. Which is kind of very uh, interesting. I don't know whether it hits you that that false teaching is as old as the truth. That the opposition has always been there. And it's very interesting that Paul takes us back all the way to Exodus. And I think you can even go back all the way to Genesis. That opposition to the truth, rebellion has always and is always going to be there. It's almost as if Paul is saying, look, in the past, in the ancient times, Moses, that miracle-working guy, was opposed. In the future, Timothy, the last days, this is what it's going to be for you. It's men and women who are going to be opposing the truth. And I think it's, it's very good for us to get this because the opposition of the truth is not necessarily that they stand in a crusade and oppose you. It is that they look to be doing exactly what you are doing, except that when you look at it, uh, in a closer view, these people are not with you. Uh, it's very good for us to get that because we kind of sometimes think, oh yeah, uh, for those who are Kenyans, I know Kanyari, you know, he is just the false teacher. It's obvious for everybody. But I think the point here is these people are sometimes going to be so much within us that we are not even going to realize that that's the way they are doing it. They are going to do things almost that look like copycats of what we are doing. They might even say the right words like we are saying them. But when you follow them, their mystery, their intention, their purpose is not in line with the gospel. So let's not be naive about false teaching, about false living, about uh, the gospel that has no fruit. Let us be so much aware of these particular teachings that are within us and that are everywhere. But Paul has some hope uh, for Timothy here. Because he says, these kind of men who oppose the truth, these who are corrupted and who are even disqualified regarding the faith, verse 9, their end will soon come. In other words, they will not continue forever and ever. They will be exposed, he says, look at verse 9, but they will not get very far. For their folly will be praying to all, as was that of those two men. You know, sometimes false teachers can seem to be thriving and thriving and only getting more and more popular. But it is good for us to know that their folly will be exposed, they will come to an end. It's good for us to have the confidence that as, as we know, and as we avoid these particular people and false teachers, that we shouldn't surrender and think, oh yeah, there is nothing we can do, or this is it. No. Their end, their folly, their foolishness, their, their bad tactics, will soon be exposed. I think it's, uh, it's good for us to know that not even the false teachers are beyond the reach of God. They are not, they are not as it were, sort of competing on an equal measure with God. A day will come, a time will come, whether presently in this world, or even towards the end of time when their folly will actually be exposed to everyone. 
the other day we were talking with a friend about how uh, some prophets, uh, you might have read those stories, had predicted and, and prophesied that Trump uh, would win the elections. And, and, and it, was, it was quite a shame when they were put on display and when their folly was visible to everyone. Or some of you might remember just, uh, I think, two years ago when there was that uh, drama in South Africa uh, when one a pastor had you know, acted with one of his followers that they had resurrected them. They had prayed for them and they had woken up from, uh, from being dead. Um, when that thing was exposed, and the man was proven that he was not dead indeed. And it was a, a display. And I think the Lord allows those kind of times when even mistakes to be done. And here in Kenya we have had those kind of expose uh, of people being exposed, uh, people like Kanyari and others, and their foray being visible to everyone. But even in the end of times, when Christ shall come, Truly, their folly will be visible to everyone. It's something to pray for because many people have been taken captive. In fact, the weak and the vulnerable have been taken prey by these people. Some families have been broken because these men have prayed on these particular families and they have either taken captive of the men there or the women there or the children there. And it has such you know, gone such depth. People have sold their properties to follow some of these false teachers. It is such a tragedy for us. But as Paul here is stressing to Timothy, he's, he's, he's almost saying to Timothy, don't be naive, Timothy, about the times you are in and even the times that things are going to go. Don't be uh, wishy washy, wishing that things will get, oh yeah, things will get better. No, things will just get worse and worse. And I think the point for Timothy and for us today is to tune our antenna electric. Is to be on the lookout. Is to, to see, as Paul says, is to understand, is to know, is to have the insight. Some of the people who have passed through this program and have gone out of, from us and, and have joined uh, uh, you know, other churches and, and the world outside, they have been very ignorant even as they thought about looking for a church and they thought, ah, yeah, this is a, a minor problem you know, this pastor is not that clear but you know, you know, I think it's not a big deal oh yeah, no, 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 it's a big deal and you need to be very very careful about any uh, false teacher outside there don't just think, oh, this is a minor problem, this is a, a different opinion no. Be on the know-how. Understand this. Avoid even those kind of people. Because false teaching comes sometimes clothed in very good clothes. Nice words, even good intentions. But as Paul reminds Timothy, this is the context of all ministry. That we have false teachers within and without. As we noted the other day, it is in the great house not necessarily outside of the great house. So be on the lookout. Be cautious. Rest. You become a prey to them or you become a victim or you become one who propagates and encourages that. So what is the big thing here? Again, two imperatives. Understand this. Know this. Friends, know about false teaching. It is there, it is here, it will continue to be there. But as you know that, avoid such kind of people. Avoid those kind of false teachers. Learn away from them, free from them. And may the Lord help us. Oh, and may the Lord have mercy on us that we will neither become prey and neither will become those who propagate false teaching in whatever areas we find ourselves. Lord Jesus, help these dear ones and myself that we will stand on the rock, on the truth of the gospel. 
and that nothing Lord in us or outside of us will drive us to be those who live like these false men whose character and ministry is fraud and is not in line with the gospel. Those men who's, who have who walk in piety but no godliness but that God will be those who are living, being sanctified by your word and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.